And we'll continue with the ninth chapter of The Cockatrice Boys by Joan Aiken. At Aloha, the Cockatrice crew had a lot of bridge building to do before the viaduct across the links of Forth was safe. It took them two days' work, and the nights were passed in battling off hordes of Kelpies, who would have undone all the work again. Aloha was a fishing and ferry town where large boats had once been tied up, had once tied up. It lay between three rivers, the Devon, the Black Devon, and the wide Forth itself, meandering in shimmering links, meandering in shining links across the marshy plain to meet its estuary. Few people lived here anymore because of the Kelpies, which came in extra numbers because of the double tides. The town was wreathed in juicy green weed and smelt of salt damp. To the north, less than a mile across the flat floor of the valley, on, either, on the other side of the Devon River, rose the menacing slopes of the Ocellus, like a steep volcanic wall, which they once had been, clothed in oak and fir capped with snow. There was a rumor running about the train that a big battle was imminent. No one knew where it had started. Everybody was keyed up and excited. When Dakin took when Dakin took the Colonel's eleven o'clock acorn coffee, he had been allotted this task since the loss of Sauna. He found a conference going on with Clipspeak, Upfold, Major Scanty, and the Archbishop. There is a legend, a folk myth, or whatever you care to call it, current in Melrose, that Michael Scott spent some of the, the last weeks of his life in Sorrow Abbey and that he may perhaps have left the book there, said Dr. Wren. Oh, exclaimed Dyken, suddenly putting two and two together. That must have been what old licorice was jawing on about. I mean, Tom Flint, sorrow, he kept saying, sorrow, sorrow. Flint, he mentioned sorrow, Abby. Did he say, what did he say about it? Dr. Wren was galvanized. Why, pray, did you not tell us before? I forgot, mumbled Dyken. He said such a lot, it didn't seem important. He was going on and on about glens and abbeys and hermits' caves. You forgot, you wretched wretched boy. Did he mention the location of Sorrow Abbey? Is it not on, is it not on the map? suggested Colonel Clipsbeak, hopefully. Unfortunately, no, Colonel. It was sacked and pillaged so many times during the border wars that its whereabouts are na- now are wholly uncertain. It seems reasonable to assume, however that it is not too far distant from the town of Dollar, probably Dolar in the first place, and presumably situated somewhere in Glen Sorrow, which runs up from Dollar to the north end of Ben Clage. Yes, that makes sense, agreed the colonel, consulting his his wall map. But if it is not there any longer, I do not see that there is much use in sending an expeditionary force to search for this hypothetical volume, if there are not even ruins, we can hardly search the whole glen. What else did Tom Flint say to you, boy? Try to rack your brains. This is terribly important. The book. He said it was wrapped in cloth of copper, pinned with a gold pin. What is the book, sir? Michael Scott's Book of Power. It is said to answer every possible question with a moral scientific... Michael Scott's Book of Power. It is said to answer every possible question with a moral, scientific, practical, and theoretical... A kind of inquire within upon everything, remarked Upfold. Pretty handy, eh? Would presumably tell us how to get rid of the monsters. What is even more important, said Dr. Wren, is to prevent it falling into the hands of the adversaries. Adversaries, that's what Flint called them too, said Dyken. His friends, he said they were. Fine friends. Fine friends? He'll be sorry at the end of the day, snapped Scanty. Yes, recalled Dyken. He wasn't so happy about them when he thought they had skived off and left him, and his hands and feet hurt him so bad. I asked where they had taken Sauna, and he said, Wait a mo, I'm getting it. Something about Crook of Devon and Rumbling Bridge. He said He said there were lots of witches there. Used to be, a couple of centuries ago, said Dr. Wren. The Ocellus have always been borderline country, between lowlands and highlands, between this world and the next. Did Flint say what his friends proposed to do with the Book of Power? I've forgotten, said Dyken sadly. Something to do with the disintegration of human, eth- of human ethos. There, were a, there was a lot of long words. 
Oh, why didn't I stay with that with the miserable wretch myself? lamented the archbishop. You were saying a good many men's lives who had been severely hurt by basilisks, the colonel briskly reminded him, who would almost certainly be dead by now if it weren't for you were saving a good many men's lives who had been severely hurt by basilisks, the colonel reminded it briskly reminded him, who would almost certainly be dead by now if it weren't for you. They all stared at Dykin, as if they would like to pull memory out of him like teeth. Maximum chaos, Dykin remembered. First they got the monsters through a hole in the ozone layer. Now they want to stir up more trouble. And the book will help them do this. Suppose so. Dykin felt terribly tired, what with watching Tom Flint and guilty worry over Sauna and the Kelpie battle. And that feeling that everybody disapproved of him. All he wanted to do was lie down and forget his troubles in, his, in sleep. He was aware of the onset of a yawn working its way working its way all the way from his toes. He struggled against it until his ears cracked, but out it came. All right, boy, you can go, said the colonel warily. A croaking voice suddenly made them all jump. It came from nobody in the room. It was faint as it floated in. From far away, shrill and full of malice. Don't go to Dollar, it said. Don't go to Dollar. And then ran off into gibberish. And then ran off into gabbled nursery nonsense. A dollar, a dollar, a ten o'clock scholar, what makes you rise so soon? Don't look for Sana unless you would mourn her. She'll die before the new moon. King Edward's day, King Edward's day, that's when they gather, that's when they play. That's when their strength is highest. We must, we must have it by then, the voice died away. That was my auntie Floss, said Dykin, working his tongue around his mouth to moisten it. Or at least it sounded like her the time I went to her place in Manchester, and I thought I heard Sana's voice too just for a moment. They all stared at him. He suddenly remembered something. Tom Flint had this bit of paper. He said his friends forgot he had it. He couldn't read it, nor could I. I put it in my pocket when the siren went. He pulled it out, dirty, crumpled, greasy, slightly frayed at the cracks where it had been folded, the eyes of everybody in the room fastened on it like staples. That's Ogham's script, said Dr. Wren. Can you read it? asked the colonel. And that is the end of chapter nine.